Hello there guys. You might remember about this time last year I produced a few videos on the kits that I have in my stash. I did one video on AFV kits, one on aircraft, and one on cars, ships, and sci-fi models. Well there was one more group of models which I didn't cover in those videos and that was my figure kits. These days I don't generally buy figure kits that often, but when I first got into modelling I started to buy kits with almost every AFV kit that I'd purchased. So in this video I'd like to show you the figure kits in my stash and how I plan to use them. And if you want to watch those previous videos you can find the links in the description below. So we'll start with this German infantry at rest set from Mini Art. This is a nice easy one. You might remember maybe two years ago I built this Jagdpanther. And it wasn't quite finished at the time. But my ultimate plan is to have this Jagdpanther in a barn or something similar, a sort of laying in weight. Um, or laying in hiding with these figures around it. My vision is kind of of a, um, a three-sided barn with the fourth side open to the viewer. And although the outside of the barn will be visible and there'll be a few bits and pieces around, really the diorama will be the interior shot of the barn. Maybe these guys are resting after a long day, maybe they're sort of hiding out, maybe there'll be some injured soldiers in there as well, uh, just something along those lines. I probably do need some of the figures as well because I'll need some tank crew and I would probably like a few more resting figures as well. But that is my uh, plan for these guys. The next kit is from Trumpeter who we don't really see making figures that often. This one I've had in my stash for a long time because I've actually built the uh, Leopold gun that goes with it um, and I built it before I started my channel. So I'm not quite sure why I never got around to putting the Leopold on a base and putting these figures on it. Uh, maybe that's something I'll have to do in a, uh, an upcoming video fairly soon. Let's have a quick look inside this one. So we've got seven figures here. Various poses, sort of loading the ammunition onto the Leopold. Let's check these sprues out. So a fairly standard parts breakdown, as you would imagine. These figures look okay, I think, don't they? Not super sharp, but not terrible. I do notice that a lot of them have separate hands there, which I always find quite difficult. A bit of sort of flash around the outside, but nothing major. Some nice folds in their uniforms. We have this second sprue here, which has got lots of wood textured parts on it, including a base with some footprints on. I think the other parts there are clearly designed to be sort of ammunition crates and things like that. I'm not sure about that wooden base though. The instructions show us with the figures posed there. I wonder if that is to pose the figures if you don't actually have the Leopold, if you just want to paint the crew then uh, you can just use that as a section from the Leopold. Because if we look at the box art there, you can see the Leopold itself has a very different um, decking structure. So maybe that's it. Anyway, I'll have to get my Leopold down from the top shelf. It's too big to fit anywhere else. And uh, maybe have a go at uh, building some figures and a base for it. Maybe that will fit nicely on the top of my shelves next to my Dora. Next up, a kit which I have no idea what I'm going to do with. This is the East Meets West kit in 135th scale still. Uh, this is the meeting of the US and the Soviet forces on the Elbe River in 1945 towards the end of the war. We get four figures here, basically two pairs of figures greeting each other. I guess I bought this kit because it was really unusual, but as I say, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to use it. I can't see it being part of a bigger diorama because this, I guess, would be sort of the this need to be the center of something. But then, if it was just these four figures on their own, it would look quite odd as well. So I'm not sure. We need some kind of vehicles, I think, in the background. Maybe not big armor vehicle, armored vehicles. I don't know. Maybe sort of little jeeps or something like that. Really not sure what I'm going to do with this one. As is standard with a lot of these manufacturers, the instructions and the paint callouts are just on the back of the box. 
Okay, next up is quite a nice kit here. This is German military police with two dogs. Two figures, two dogs. Quite a few potential uses for this one. Since, of course, they're obviously guarding something, and because we've got the hint there and the artwork in the background, I'm thinking something like um, a railway diorama. If you remember my previous videos, I do have a wagon that I could use in this regard. And maybe just have them walking around it. We could even, I suppose, have some kind of uh, commando figures or um, resistance figures, maybe on the other side of the wagon, um, about to attack it or something. I don't know, but I think that's how I'm going to use these. Next up, we have possibly the weirdest kit um, I have. To be honest, I got a bit tricked by this kit. I bought it thinking it was including the um, tank itself. I thought it was a bit cheap for the tank, but I thought it was a bit too expensive just for three, three figures. And the reason it's expensive is because we don't get three figures, we get six figures. We get each of these three figures twice. I have no idea why, it seems completely pointless. If you remember my Renault R35 video from a while ago, you'll notice that I use those figures here. Although for some reason I'm not showing them in this photo. But yeah, just a very strange kit. We get each figure twice, including the motorcycle rider, but we only get one motorcycle. So it's a bit silly. Anyway, at some point I might throw a couple of these figures near a World War I tank. I don't really have any French tanks, but uh, we'll work something out. Next up, another kit from MiniArt. This is their Battle of the Bulge set with some captured US soldiers. I do like the artwork on the front of these MiniArt boxes. Really, really uh, evocative. I think what I'll do for this kit is perhaps pair it with a, um, a German tank, perhaps the border um, Panzer IV Late J. I just have to check if that was uh, in service at the time. I don't think I'm going to include a US tank with this one, like a, a destroyed US tank or anything like that. Uh, I think just these figures on their own. A lovely paint guide there on the back, including the um, German um, dot camouflage scheme, I forget what you call it now. That'll be fun to paint. I've painted that a few times in the past. Mini Art's up again for the next kit, and this is something that I've used several of the figures from. So I've already used Cheery Man over here. I've used Breadbasket Man. I haven't used the other three. And to be honest, I find that quite often in a kit that you've got certain figures you're just not sure how to use. So the priest, the civilian, and the policeman. I'm not really sure how I could use those in a military scene. I suppose we could have sort of a German troops in a French street and just some bystanders. But yes, I'm not, not really sure how to use those yet. Uh, the figures I have used, by the way, they were on an old diorama uh, before my YouTube channel. They were greeting some uh, British soldiers who were arriving on a uh, Churchill. Nice easy one up next. British tank crew in winter uniform. I know exactly how I'm going to use these. I have used this middle figure already, actually, when I did my Tamiya quad. He was the guy who was hungrily stalking that uh, goose. However, the way I'm going to use the remaining figures is I'm going to take my Dragon Firefly, put it in some winter camouflage, possibly with some uh, bed sheets to camouflage it rather than the winter whitewash paint. Something like these reference photos here. Staying on the British theme, we've got this master box set of British paratroopers in World War II, Operation Market Garden, seemingly asking for directions from this local man. Again, I've got a good idea of how I want to use this. I imagine them in front of this house here by Diodump, which I did a review of a long time ago and I do want to build soon. Possibly supported by a vehicle. And that vehicle would be either my Staghound, my Archer, my Universal Carrier, or my Achilles. Amongst other things, I need to look up which of those vehicles actually were involved in Market Garden uh, before I include them. On a side note, it's really nice to look back at old on a side note, it's really nice to look back at your old kits, isn't it? I really enjoyed making those kits, especially the Archer and the Achilles. Those open top vehicles, I really enjoyed the, uh, the process. Maybe I'll find myself some more. 
Okay, next up, Master Box again. We've got some civilians, Western Region, World War II. This is one of those kits that I really bought, essentially just for one figure, which is the farmer on the left, knowing that I could probably use the other figures elsewhere. Now, originally I was going to use the farmer with my Ram Mark II. Being a tank used for training, I was going to have this tank going down a, an English country lane and the farmer sort of standing in the field next to it, watching it go by. I've slightly changed the idea now because I also want to have a Tiger I tank wrecked in a field with a farmer standing next to it with the Mini Art tractor, which I showed you in a recent video. So I think that's now where that farmer's going to go. As for the children, I'm not really sure, but I think you can sneak a child in in the sort of background in a few places, can't you? Maybe even in that one I just showed you with the paratroopers um, looking for the bridge, Operation Market Garden. Maybe I could like sneak a child in a window looking out or something. I think the most difficult one will be the man on the right hand side. Not quite sure what to do with him. Next up, some British soldiers on patrol. These are obviously set in Northwest Europe. Now, originally, these soldiers were going to be the soldiers on patrol on training behind my Ram Mark II down that English country lane. However, the only problem, I suppose, really with these is their poses don't suggest they're sort of in formation for marching during training. They're a bit, uh, a bit raggedy, aren't they? I suppose they could be on sort of a practice patrol. But I quite like that idea anyway of them behind the ram, down a country lane, with either that farmer I just showed you or another farmer watching on the sidelines. That would be a great place for those civilian children to be looking as well, wouldn't it? So many ideas. I also quite like the idea of them perhaps being stopped with some sheep or, or some kind of farm animals um, crossing the road, blocking their path, as I saw recently in this reference photo. And to help with that scene, I've got two more farming figures here. These are from a brand called Homefront. I got these from the website Fields of Glory, and as you can see, it's two land army girls working the land. They're resin kits, which I, I don't buy very often. But these are quite unusual figures. You don't tend to get figures from the home front, but home front, the brand, as their name would suggest, do do a lot of them. They do look well moulded as well, or well cast, should I say. I think I'm going to have fun painting these. And again, these are likely to be sort of uh, standing by at the edge of the, uh, the road watching the, the troops go past, or watching the animals block their path. We get a choice of arms of this one. We have this arm here, which is sort of held up uh, towards the shoulder, which is holding the scythe, as you can see on the box art. Or we have an arm just sort of straight dangling by the side. We also have two heads, one wearing the helmet and one with just the hair. I think the hair would make the most sense. I think the hair would make the most sense in the field. And also, the, I think the face on that one looks a bit better. Next up a kit which for some reason I cut the box art out of and uh, threw away the rest. This is our German tank crew out of the frying pan into the fire. This is by Masterbox. I have a plan for these guys. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with the guy lobbing a grenade. But my idea for the other four figures is that they will be escaping my Tiger 1, which I did in snow camo, after it sunk through the ice into the river. I have some acrylic ice sheet which I bought a while ago and uh, I do want to use it because I've had it for probably a couple of years now at least. And that's originally what I planned to do but then I moved on with other projects. Next up some US soldiers from Masterbox. I think the reason I bought this kit is for the two figures here, the wounded soldier being dragged away by his mate. I envisage this on some sort of uh, D-Day beach landing scene, maybe a Sherman or something coming out of the water. Um, and this guy being dragged uh, dragged out of the surf. The problem I find with kits like this is I really like the pose for those two figures, but then the other two figures are sort of openly engaged in combat. I, I, I don't know, I feel like they don't quite go together. They're not crouching down, so I can't really have them behind a beach obstacle or anything. I, I don't know, I just 
I feel like they don't quite go together there with the other two figures. And combat scenes are quite hard to model, I think, aren't they? Talking of US soldiers, we've got this kit from Tamiya. This features six US soldiers, but I've actually used five of them already. The only one I haven't used is number six here on the back. They're sort of in combat poses, but the way I used them was in this small diorama, again made before my YouTube channel, of these soldiers approaching this rail car, and they're about to open the door, and of course their weapons are drawn because they don't know what's inside. I made this diorama a long time ago, as I say, before my channel. I didn't paint the static grass, which I probably would do now. But I'm quite happy with it overall. I quite like the dust effects on the, uh, the wagon there and on the jeep, although the jeep is very clean. And I think the fencing there in the corner gives very clear connotations about the scene without being too explicit about what the soldiers are about to uncover. Next up we've got another Tamiya kit, one of the older ones, this is from the 70s I think. To be honest I'm not really sure why I bought this, I bought it a long time ago. Probably one of my first purchases. And again I'm just not quite sure how I'm going to use the figures. If we look at them as such a mix, number one and number two are clearly sort of marching somewhere, three and four are clearly involved in combat, five, six, seven and eight are all clearly involved in combat as well. So I think it will be a case of just picking figures out uh, here and there for the odd, uh, the odd scene. I suppose really that's the most sensible way to think about it, isn't it? Rather than trying to include one scene that has all those figures. Tamiya are up again, but with a much more modern set here. This is their pioneer team with Goliath. If you're not familiar with the Goliath, it's basically a remote controlled uh, high explosive device. You can see the middle figure there. Uh, with these, uh, his controller and the cable running to the Goliath. We get parts for two Goliaths and three figures in here. Because the Goliath has to be tethered by a cable to the operator, it's more of an ambush weapon. So I'm envisaging these maybe in a set of ruins somewhere, perhaps with a um, US or Allied tank going by, and the Goliath about to spring into action. I could also use the second Goliath perhaps in a captured scenario. I know the, there are some quite famous uh, reference photos of US forces having captured them. As with a lot of Tamiya kits, we get some lovely detail on the side of the box here. So essentially colour callouts or colour guides to the accessories. And also even some um, insignia um, instructions there. And Tamiya do supply the very thin copper wire there, which will be used as the uh, control wire for the Goliath. Simple to construct the Goliath themselves. One piece for each side, top and bottom, and some link and length tracks. Next up a kit which I have a definite plan for, this British Jeep crew. I've already plundered one of the figures from here because the guy on the bottom left is the driver of my Airfix uh, ambulance. But I'm going to use the other figures here with my Dorchester ACV command centre. The figures on the top left there are clearly some kind of ranking officers so they can go in the back of that. The other two figures can maybe go somewhere around it on the outside, maybe the vehicle stuck in the sand, maybe uh, I don't know, something something along those lines. Um, but yes, that's definitely going to go with the Dorchester when I build it up. I originally bought the Soviet soldiers taking a break to go with the um, prototype um, aircraft thing whose name I can't pronounce that I built recently. The idea being that the Russian forces had overrun the test area and captured it and were now just hanging around. However, I've changed my mind for these ones. Instead, I'm going to use these now when I do a remake of my first ever diorama. I'm not going to show you a photo of that diorama now, but uh, that's how I'm going to use them in the future. Now, I kind of messed up with this next purchase. So this is a PT-109 crew. And I think my original thoughts with this is that I would use them um, with my Trumpeter LCM. Maybe I'd have that docked and they were doing some kind of maintenance work on it. Uh, maybe with the officers there overwatching them. 
However, since then, I have painted the LCM in British colours, and in fact that's almost ready, that'll be up in a future video. So I can't really use this crew. And unfortunately the dress style of these figures is such that I don't think they would really pass for British um, figures. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them, maybe I'll just have to buy a, a PT boat. Similarly, I purchased this trumpeter kit, US Navy LCM crew. And again, I've painted my LCM in British colours. These figures won't really belong on that, not least of which because the British LCMs don't have the machine guns, and two of the figures there are machine gun operators. So yes, I've kind of uh, painted myself into a corner with this one. I'm not likely to buy a second LCM, so uh, I don't know, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll sell this kit. Next up, photo for the newspaper, Russian Infantry by Masterbox. This is one of those kits that I bought because I thought, wow, this is quite a cool um, sort of scenario here. It's a nice non-combat scenario. Lots of options for this one. I could pose them in front of a Soviet tank. I could pose them in front of a damaged or destroyed German tank. The only thing to remember is that they are in winter uniform. It actually looks like the figure on the left there might even be wearing a, um, a German um, overcoat, I'm not sure. Certainly the camouflage pattern looks like that, but I'm not fully familiar with uh, Russian uniforms in World War II. Next up we have three kits in the same kind of theme, which is Wounded Soldiers. So we've got this master box set here, Ticket Home, two injured soldiers and a uh, doctor, a medic. A nice suggestion on the back there with them on a, uh, is that a Panzer I ambulance? Next up we have this Dragon Kit, 1944, one injured soldier on the ground, one tending to him, one sort of keeping watch with a, what looks like a uh, Sherman or a Sherman Firefly outside, and then a, uh, a medic coming over. And then finally we have this set here, again from Dragon, a couple of injured soldiers and a couple of medics, including the stretcher. Now I did have an idea for one huge diorama involving these, uh, I'm not sure how sensible that idea is, but basically my idea was to have my BR-52 having been derailed by some kind of sabotage, have come off the rails, so sort of down a small embankment, and these soldiers um, having been injured in that accident. Now obviously for them to be injured in that I would need some kind of uh, troop transport wagon to be pulled by the BR-52. And I suppose that's where the difficulty comes in because the engine here on its own is about 80 centimeters long according to the box. Any kind of wagon would also be very long as well so we'd be looking at quite a big diorama. However I haven't given up on that plan yet because I do like the idea. I have this vision of it sort of sliding off the side of a railway line um, into a field with it on its side perhaps, certainly with the, um, the troop transporter on its side and then a road not too far away from the line where vehicles have come and uh, the medics are dealing with these uh, casualties. But who knows if that will ever come into fruition. Moving on, a very strange uh, kit now. I bought this one for the novelty value. Um, we've got these German paratroopers, um, 1939 to 1942. And the thing that really attracted me to this kit is this figure on the left-hand side, um, sort of uh, just um, reading in his parachute. We've got a few other in-combat poses too. But we actually get, if we look inside, that parachute is a, uh, a piece of styrene, or several pieces of styrene, should I say. So here are the figure sprues. The detail on this is a little bit soft, but we do get lots of accessories as well. I did notice, I quite like this, the fact that the hands are moulded to the um, weapons. I always find getting weapons into figures' hands really difficult, so I know it does limit you a bit because you've got to make them hold a weapon, but if that's what their poses are doing, it does make sense, I think, to actually have them moulded on. Here is the first of the parachute sprues. These massive styrene pieces, but no eject pin marks on either side, which is nice. And there's the other four pieces. 
obviously that's going to be out of scale. I mean, you could make your own parachute, but it would be quite difficult to get it into shape. I guess what you could do is put this styrene one together and then take something like some tissue and um, maybe dampen it down with some uh, watered down PVA and use the styrene as a sort of a, a shape to mold the tissue around. You would probably have to use some kind of um, a cling film food wrap kind of thing over the styrene to stop the paper sticking though. And the kit even includes some thread for those parachute cards. Next up a really lovely kit from Stalingrad Models. Children of War 1945, five child figures playing on a tank. I'm not going to open all these small plastic bags because uh, they neatly divide the figures but you can see here just how well moulded these are, how well cast these resin figures are. As I say, I don't buy resin figures often, but I thought these ones were quite novel. This is one of the larger figures. This is the kid hanging off the end of the, uh, the gun barrel there. So given their uh, poses, there's not much I can do uh, with these figures other than put them on an abandoned tank. But of course that is quite a cool scenario to do, so I will be working on that at some point. Finally for my military figures, I said I don't buy resin kits often, but here's another one. This is a kit that I just had to have once I saw it. Um, the AC models Lancaster crew in 1 32nd scale, which of course is perfect to go with my HK 1 32nd scale Lancaster. Lancasters are a favourite subject of mine. There's a bit of a family connection because my grandfather was a tail gunner in Lancasters, so I'm really looking forward to building this. The only reason I haven't done it so far is because I don't want to do it injustice with some terrible painting. Again, I'm not going to open the bags here for the figures, but I think even through the plastic, you can see the great level of detail that we've got here on this kit. This is not a widely available kit, uh, AC Models is a New Zealand based company. I got this from BNA Models in Australia, who do actually ship to the UK. I, I bought this when I was in Malaysia, but they do ship to the UK, um, and it's not too expensive for a lot of things either. Surprisingly so. But yeah, it looks absolutely great, and I just hope that my painting skills will um, suffice. And finally, a change of theme away from military and a change of scale to 1 20th scale. My Tamiya Motorsports team set. As you can see here, we've got nine figures from that kind of golden era of, um, well, Formula One really, 1970 to 1985. You could get away with using them slightly later than that, although some of the fashion sense of the period is captured in these figures. So again, this is probably one of those kits where I'll use one or two figures at a time rather than trying to squeeze them all in at once. And in fact, I've already got a small diorama in progress which uses the photographer and the team manager figure. You can see on the side of the box here that we've got um, some tools and other things included. Let's have a look inside. We have our driver figure here that some of the Tamiya car kits include as well although this figure will only fit some of the Tamiya kits. We've got this slightly yellowed um, plastic here. This is not um, age that's caused this. Every kit I've seen like this, including the ones I had when I was a kid, have always been this slightly off-white colour. Not bad detailing considering their age. Of course we would get better these days, but uh, this is an old, old kit. Actually, for F1 nerds like me, it's small details like these helmets which kind of date these kits. So that very unique helmet there is the Bell XF Twin Window, which is only used in the early 80s, if I remember correctly. You wouldn't see that today. And even the shape of uh, the helmets in general just kind of date them to a certain period. But that's all good. I've got lots of F1 car kits from that period. We've got lots of tools and accessories here as well to make a, uh, a busy pit wall or garage.
and some nice Armco barrier there as well for a racing scene. Now, of course, one of the difficulties with these kits is that the team personnel are typically covered in sponsors' logos. We do get a decor sheet with those in. Uh, so we've got the driver's names on the left-hand side there for the pit boards. Um, on the left-hand side here, I'm not sure what those are. I'm not sure what team they belong to. Maybe they're just for fuel containers and things like that. On the right-hand side, the Parmalat uh, logos are for the Brabham team. I don't have that Brabham kit. In the middle, we have the decals for Ferrari. And I'm not sure about the other ones, to be honest. I'll have to look that up. However, I was really lucky because I was able to get some custom decals made by Thomas from Building Our Budget Models. And he made some fantastic crew uniform decals for the Williams team. And you'll be seeing those in a future video. Finally, we have another Tamiya 120th scale kit. This is their tyre changing pit crew. I've actually built this kit before, but I like it so much I wanted to build it again and do a better job. Here we have seven figures. All in shorts and shirts. You could use these up to, I would say, around about the early 1990s. After that, F1 pit crews tended to have much more protection because refueling was introduced in uh, 1994. So probably 1993 would be the latest you'd be able to, uh, to use this kit for. And in fact, we have a 1990 Ferrari there on the side of the box art. So we get enough figures here for the front and the rear jack the lollipop man and two of the wheels. I suppose you could combine a second set to have figures doing all four wheels, although of course then the figures would be identical unless you did a bit of customization. Nevertheless, I think it sets the scene quite well. Just like the previous kit, we have lots of accessories in here. The detail is very similar to the previous kit, having been released around the same time. Of course, at this kind of scale, your painting is much more visible and I think the first time I made this kit, it was the face painting that let me down. We also have a sprue with lots of accessories, including um, gas cylinders for operating the air guns, and front and rear jacks, of course. This kit has decals, but they are slightly yellowed and will need replacing. I notice that on the instructions, we have this uh, four-step guide to painting faces, which is quite a nice addition. Inside, just building up the equipment. Different styles of rear jack there, depending on how high the jacking point is. Building up our figures. We do get the uh, material cable there for the uh, air guns. Okay guys, so that was a look at the figure kits in my stash and what I plan to do with them. I hope you enjoyed looking at those kits, hearing some of the ideas I have for future dioramas, and seeing how I've used some of these figures in existing pre-YouTube dioramas. I would like to say thank you to all of you for watching, and of course if you have any ideas about how I can use these figure kits, or any sort of future dioramas that you might like to see, then please do feel free to leave a comment below. I always like to hear your ideas, I always appreciate the feedback, and I do my absolute best to reply to every comment. I've got several projects in progress at the moment, all of them nearing the finish line, and I will be back with another video shortly. Until then, have a fantastic week, and have fun modelling.